Good evening, everybody. Thank everybody for being in here, and um, thank everybody for uh, tuning in online. I'm just going to remind you all that it's much better live. We have a good time here. Um, have a good time in any church when, when people of God come together and you get to talk and, and fellowship with each other. Um, coming up for Thanksgiving, um, I want I would like to just tell everybody that um, no matter where you are in life or who you are in life or what your circumstances are in life, um, if you believe in God, you have something to be thankful for. If Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have something to be thankful for regardless of what's going on. So we'll get started with this little song that kind of goes along with that, um, that same concept. Some of us don't have any money. This bill just can't pay. We all need to believe it at the will of the Some people can get it to other people, it's not. It's just like the flu. Some people get the flu and they get a sniffle nose and a headache and two days later they're fine. So other people get the flu and they're home in bed for a week. You know? So people have died from this. So please don't make light of it to people. You know, uh, We all have our opinions and we can joke about it, have fun. But be respectful of others and all. More than anything, let's pray for one another. Doesn't the Bible say that a lot? Paul encourages pray for one another. 
let's pray for those people. I was talking with a guy today, and we were talking about being aggravated, you know, and you know, driving and stuff like that, and people cutting you off and, and being ag aggravated. And, and I don't know whether this guy was a believer. I had my own opinion on whether I, I, I know whether he's a brother or sister in Christ. But I told him this. I said, you ever thought about just praying for them? He's like, I don't even know. What's that got to do with it? You know, the Bible says that we should first pray, right? Before we do anything, we should pray. We should always seek God's presence and God's guidance. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. No, but I'll tell you what we need to do is we need to pray for people. One, that they have comfort and peace in their life. More than anything, that they have Christ in their life. That will bring comfort and peace. But those that don't, that may be fearful or whatever, that they will get to that point where they'll have comfort and they'll have peace. And allow people to do what they feel they need to do. All right? If someone feels they need to wear a mask, that's not an opening for you to get on them. I mean, we do. Sherman and I, we pick on each other, the guys in the men's group, and, and we joke around and stuff like that. But it doesn't openly give us to confront strangers and, and be rude to people or mean to people. Uh, I, I've seen a sign, I'm not going to say where, and it says that our health, your health, is your responsibility. Well, those people are taking responsibility for their health, and they shouldn't be called out for that. Okay? If they don't want to shake your hand, I've said this before, it doesn't mean they don't like you, it just means they don't want to shake your hand. Me personally, I believe that the spread of this disease happens more by contact than it ever does by breathing, by anything. I believe it's contact. I believe that it's transferred hand to hand, box to box, doorknob to doorknob, whatever it is. I, I, I feel, you know. So, but let's be respectful of others and let's pray for others because those people that do get this are sick. Okay? Whether it's a little bit sick, or really bad sick, they're sick. And the Bible says that we should pray for those. So I want to encourage us all to, to lighten up, smile more, have more joy in your life, and, and pray a little more. And I guarantee you what, if you start praying a little more, you'd have everything I just talked about. You'd have a little more joy, a little more peace, a little more happiness in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we just lift you up for what an awesome, mighty God you are. You are worthy to be praised. You are the only one that's worthy to be praised. There are no other gods, as you know, people like to think that there are. But you are the God that is in control. You are the creator of all things. You are the only one worthy of our praise. You are the only one righteous, perfectly right. Uh, with that, you seek out righteousness. And you would like us to be righteous, right with you. So, Father, we have come here tonight to maybe work on that a little bit and try to figure out a way to be more like your son Jesus to figure out maybe there's things that you need to open our eyes to tonight that we need to change a little bit or maybe add to a little bit or do a little more like pray Father we can't ever pray enough but Lord we have sought out you here either online through Facebook or wherever or personally sitting in this building we've come here to be in your presence so it be my prayer Lord that you would touch the heart of each and every one that can hear my voice Lord, that I decrease and that you increase, and it's your words that spread through this. That, Lord, from your church, the greatest thing that comes out of all this, from your church, the things that people see the most is compassion and respect for others. That we have love for one another. That we build up and not tear down. That we share and not hold on to. Share that love and grace that you've given us with the world that your son died. Father, I ask now that you would just speak to us in a mighty way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I think, J.J., I was going to remind you, or I was going to say as a reminder, I don't think J.J. mentioned it, that we're not going to have service next Wednesday. No service no next service Wednesday. next Wednesday, if I remember. Right. Everybody will be cooking turkeys. That's right. And stuff. I'll probably be being a turkey. Yeah. <laughs> I'll feel like a turkey after all of it. I'm going to say this, though. You know, if we spend more time praying for people and less time talking about them, Amen. Um, we would have a lot more uh, a lot more peace in life and a lot more peace with others and with each other. And we're called to have with peace with others. And we're called to be a peacemaker. So uh, I guess the next time I'm thinking about something that I want to say that's not prayerful, I need to... Be quiet. <laughs> yeah, I need to think. And he does. <clears throat>
Kind of changes with the seasons, doesn't it? I don't know. Have you ever pulled into a place and wondered how in the heck you were going to get turned around? You ever drove down in a road? I, I robbed my buddy, and uh, he worked a shoot down here the other day. And I rode with him and stuff, and he's driving a truck down, and he got himself in a bind. And made me think about this uh, this message. And he got himself down there in a bind and stuff, and he said, like he said, he almost got to a point where he couldn't get in, and he couldn't get out. You know what I mean? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been down that road a few times? In a tr you know, I've been up and down the road in a horse and, uh, uh, with a horse trailer and a truck. You know, I had a big old 450 flatbed and a four-horse uh, small living quarters trailer. I guess it was probably, I don't know, I want to say 36 feet long maybe. But I mean, all together is a pretty good size. And, and uh, gosh, I can't even begin to imagine how many miles I drove. And, and I thought I'd always rely on my own experience, you know what I mean? The, the more I drove, the more places I got, you know, the, the more I could get into, the more I could get out of, right? You know? And uh, <laughs> some of you may know, I've, I've said this before, at one time, you know, I was going down the road, and I had uh, a guy that was experienced, rode over, and been with me for a while, going up and down the road, and we had another rookie like me, and going up and down the road, and I'd been going for a little while and stuff, and it was a Friday, and we were in nowhere, Arkansas, and we needed to go to the bank, and I got this bright idea that I could get that truck and trailer through the drive through ATM. And uh, so I'm asking the guys, you know, I'm thinking I can do this, you know, if I get over here and move it this way and angle it back up and all, I'll be able to pull this thing through there. And, and you know, the, the experienced guy going down the road is sitting there telling me, he's saying, look, dude, I mean, you really don't want to go in there. We can go around and get out and go in the bank or find another ATM or whatever. And the other rookie's like me. He's like, man, go for it. I think you can do it. <laughs> you know? And so uh, how do you think it's all turned out? <laughs> well, 
Come to me, it was a Friday afternoon, around 5.30, and everybody's trying to get in the bank, cash their checks, and that big old 30-something foot trailer's blocking about three or four of the entrances to the bank tellers. And they're all pulled in there on top of me now, and there's people behind them, and my buddies get out, and they're trying to back them up so that I could back up. And uh, well, there's one old gentleman there, and he said he wasn't backing up. And he said, well, sir, you know, we can sit here all day, but until you do, we're stuck. You know? So they got back in the truck, and they told me, you know, once we got out, that next time, that don't, the experienced guy said, next time I'm driving, and you're getting out and moving the people. Because I don't think they were very nice to him, you know. And, uh, but I got to thinking, that's kind of how we go through life sometimes, isn't it? That we'll get ourselves in corners and we'll get turned around and we'll get messed around. And we just figure we can get ourselves out of this stuff, you know? I mean, especially the older we get, right, Sherman? You know, the wiser we get, or either that or the dumber we get, uh, uh, that we just feel that we can get ourselves out of it, that we can turn our life around on our own. You know, if we get ourselves in too big a bind, we can just turn it around and back away, you know? And, and the sad thing is that we can't. And here's where we make the biggest mistake. is we think that we can do it ourselves. That when we get in a bind, when we get in a spot, we can't get turned around. We feel that we can turn this thing around ourselves. Have you ever heard a parent say, you got yourself into this mess, you're going to have to get yourself out of this mess. Now, I've heard that a few times. The only problem is, like, my one phone call from the Cross Bar Motel. You know, my dad's like, yeah, if I hear from your mom, I'll tell her, click. I'm like, boy, that was a waste of a quarter, you know. Uh, but we feel that when we rely on ourselves and our experience, and we know better, we've lived enough, and we know what we can do. Either that, or in our great wisdom, we ask somebody that doesn't know any more than we do. We got a buddy over there that he hasn't got a clue what's going on. You know, have you ever seen married people ask single people for marriage advice? Or how about, have you ever had your children and get advice for someone that doesn't have any kids? You ever had that? You know what I mean? They haven't got a clue what they're talking about, but they are freely willing to tell you how you should raise yours. Is that how you're going to raise your kids? Oh, no, I don't want to get you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's how I think that you should raise your kind of like that rookie guy in the truck, right? He's like, yeah, man, go for it, go ahead. I think this is how you got to go. Buddy, you can do it. I know you can. I've seen you get into places. You can get through this. And evidently, I couldn't. <laughs> because we got her in there pretty tight and backwards was the only way we could go. So if we're truly interested in turning our lives around, we're truly interested in, 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 in getting things going the other direction. The way we're going, the road we're in, it's a dead end, it's a roadblock, we're stumbling, we're stopped. There's a few things we got to do, but I can tell you, here's where it starts. If you've got your Bible, turn to James chapter 4. And, and we're going we're gonna to read some things in here. James chapter 4, verse 6. I think we're going to start in verse 6. Let me read down to 10 and 11. James chapter 4. It is starting verse 6. It said, And he gives grace generously. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here we go. Here's, here's how we can start to turn things around. That's what the Bible says. So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God. God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you <clears throat> purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be more sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? What do you mean all this, you know, gloom and, and, and no joy and no laughter? You know, isn't that what the, being a Christian is all about, right? We're supposed to have joy and peace and laughter. It just says now, remember it says, it says, let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter. Let there be gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Uh, he will lift you up in honor. So we see here two things that God will do, right? If we if we're going to turn it around. Because a lot of times as believers, we feel that we need to go to God and God's going to do what? 
God's going to turn it around, right? I'm going to give it to God. God, it's your problem now. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of what I say when I drop the grandkids back off at their house after two Mountain Dews and a Snickers bar. <laughs> They're your problem now. Yeah. But that's not how it works. But it says there are two things that God will do. It says God will come close to us, right? Isn't that what it said in there? God said God will come close and God will lift us up. So God will draw close to us and God will lift us up and that will turn it around, right? See, that's what we like to read in the scripture. We like to see that part of it. I, I, I said this a little bit Sunday. We're really good about reading a passage and say, I like this, and I like this, and I like that. Oh, did I ever say that? You know, I've never seen that in there before. Oh, yeah, the part about me having to do something. You know, I must have skipped over that. God just never revealed that to me that he actually wanted me to do something. But that's, isn't that what the Bible said? It said, preacher, I've been praying for a whole my whole life. And it ain't got any better. I'm no better off today than I was a year ago. I just can't turn it around. So it's praying. All we have to do. Pray God, Lord, here you take this, turn this around, you fix this. Lord, I can't do it. You know what God's like thinking? The same thing that old guy was thinking when I pulled in that thing. You were smart enough to get yourself in. Are you smart enough to get yourself out? And say, here's the thing. There's some things I had to do to get out of there. And the first thing I had to realize was there was no way I was backing out of there by myself. If it wouldn't have been for them two other guys, I don't know what I'd have done. Yeah, I'd still be there. And good thing it was a living quarters, right? Yeah. Hanging out at the bank in Arkansas. I don't even know what town we were in. Uh, <laughs> You know, the Bible tells us the things that God will do, but if we go on, go on and read, it says it brings up the things that we need to do for this to happen. You know what I mean? It's just like back in that truck out there. I had to position here so that this guy could do this. And I had to position there so that guy could move out of the way here. See, if I wasn't assisting in all of this, we weren't going nowhere. You know, I could have sat there and prayed, God, you need to get me out of here, but I'd still be there. So what does it look like? What does this mean to you? Humble yourself before God and resist the devil. What's, what's it, what, what, does that, what does that mean? What does that look like in a life of a believer? Someone that is a brother and sister in Christ. Someone that has accepted Christ. Someone that is trying to live their life in Christ's likeness. What does that look like? Humble yourself before God and resist the devil. Well, let's unpack this. I like that saying. I heard a preacher say this about three weeks ago. It's my saying now. I'm going to use it for a while. We're going to unpack this. We're going to take this package, we're going to unpack it, lay it out on the bed, and see it, what all's in there. You know, uh, you ever do that when you we were told as a kid to go pack your suitcase and go on vacation? Mom would come in and say, let's unpack this thing, see what all, well, we don't need this truck, we don't need this truck, and we're going to need some underwear. Okay, so, yeah. But Mom, I need that truck, right? Yeah. Kind of like us, we're trying to turn our lives around. But what does it look like in the life of a believer? When we say humble yourself before God and resist the devil. How many of y'all know what humble means? Everyone in this room should know what humble means. Others before self. Others before self. So that means humble yourself before God. That means God is first. It's very easy. God, we can't go to God and want God's help in helping us turn us around when he's like fifth on the list. And we invest nothing in God. We put nothing into God, but we expect him to be our, you know, get out of trouble card. You know, he, he's the guy we call when we got the quarter and we're in the crossbar motel. You know, and, and to humble ourselves is that we, we need to put God first. So what that means like is he is the number one most important thing in my life. To truly humble myself before God, to put God first means He's first. So does that mean on Sunday? Does that mean on Wednesdays? Hey, look, I give God two days. Wednesdays and Sundays, He's number one. Oh, God, got my necklace, we're good. No, it says, it says, in your life, that God is the most important thing in your life every day. 
He's the most important thing when you get up in the morning. He's the most important thing when you go to bed. He's the most important thing when, when you're traveling around in your work or whatever you're doing in your day. But isn't that kind of hard? No one said it was going to be easy. You know what? It wasn't easy getting that truck unstuck. But with help, it got done. And with God's help, it'll happen. And we humble ourselves and truly go to God and show Him every day that He's number one. And we veered off this road and we got ourselves stuck at an ATM. God's there. We got ourselves stuck in a ditch where we went down and we shouldn't be and we got on a road that we shouldn't go to. We're looking at things we shouldn't be. Maybe we're talking to someone in a way that maybe we shouldn't be talking to if we're in a relationship or if we're married or whatever. Whatever road it is that we've traveled down and we feel that we're stuck in, God says, if I'm number one, I'm your number one guy. Then I'm the go-to guy. I'm the guy you call. I'm the guy that you want to be first on your list but to be first on your list is first on your list in the good times and the bad times. How about this whole resist thing? What's that mean? Resist. Ain't here. <clears throat> I'm going to say this. Anybody here know the words? Stop resisting when a police officer is telling you? Ever heard the charge resisting arrest? What's that mean? What's it mean? Putting up a fight. And that's what it means here. And it's not complicated. James is saying, when the devil comes, put up a fight. Don't just get, oh, I'm too weak, preacher. You know, I just can't overcome this. You know, I'm only human. That's not what the Bible says. God says, if you want help from God, you need to be resisting the devil. You need to be trying to help yourself. You need to be trying to get out of the ditch. You need to try to get out and turn this thing around. Resist the devil means put up a fight. That means a dang good one too. You know, not just a little jab here and jab there. Oh, I tried, so I'm done. Resist means with all your effort, put up and fight. A good, heartfelt, knock down, drag out. Remember the prophet wrestling around with the, the Lord? He touched his hip, his hip popped out. He wouldn't let him go, would he? I ain't letting go of you, bless me. I ain't doing it. And he wrestled the rest of the all night long. He put up a fight. God says, am I worth fighting for? Because you're going to say I'm number one. I'm the most important thing in your life. But am I worth fighting for? Well, God, you know, you're supposed to fix that stuff. Well, you're not supposed to do that stuff. I shouldn't have to fix that stuff. If the road said do not enter, that meant do not enter. But we drive right around the barrier. I think you know, some of y'all know and heard the story that they paved the road out here one time and the guy that was doing it got really caught up in his music, was just driving up and down the road and driving up and down the road and the tar was just pouring out and it was just flooded the whole road. It was running off into people's pastures and stuff. So the county come in and closed the road. And it was a ladies Bible study night. And a lady came to Bible study. And drove around two big, huge, orange and yellow and black striped barriers that said, Road closed. And she got tar on her car. And she called me up. And she says, I came to women's group and got tar on my car. I said, but well, they didn't have women's group. The road was closed. The church was closed down. Yeah, but I drove around the barrier. When I went around the barrier, I went around to see if there's any cars there, and I got tar on my car, and I think the church should pay to get the tar on my car. I'm like, really? Well, dang, I'm on that premise. I think the church ought to build me a house. I don't know. What do you think? You know, anybody else want anything while we're putting our wish list out there? The road says close. We go down. God says, when I close a road, you'll fight to get around it if it's something you want. Won't we? Huh? I, I've had people tell me that they thought that things were of God and they fought tooth and nail to get it and come to find out it wasn't as other from the other guy. But we'll fight hard for the things we want. So why won't we fight hard against the devil? Try, Paul said this thing. He said, I do the things that I don't want to do. So these are things that Paul doesn't want to do. We all have those, right? But here's what hurt Paul more than anything. 
I don't do the things that I desire to do. Desire. He didn't say want to do. He said the things that I desire to do. The things I really deeply desire to do because of this battle in, in, in my flesh. And the only way I can keep it turned around is I draw, I put up the good fight. And I fight, I resist the devil every time he comes. And I put on my gloves. The Bible says, what should we do every morning? We should get dressed in what, Miss Kathy? The armor. the armor of God. Why? Because it's going to be a fight. If we're going to resist the devil, we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to take our swords and our shields. And we're going to have to go out because we're going to get up in the morning. We're going to open the door. We're going to get in our car. And the battle is on. And Satan's there. And the Bible, Paul says, if you, or James said, if you want to turn this around, the first thing you're going to do is put up a fight. You're going to have to resist the devil. So we're going to put God first in our life, and we're going to fight the devil every time he rears his ugly head. So he, we're on a great path of turning things around. So the next thing says, do what? Draw near to God. All right? God's number one. If he's number one, how many of y'all are married? Just about everybody here. What's well, married or is married? How many of y'all met that person and never seen him again for five years and all you did was talk to him on the phone? And you grew your relationship and they proposed over the phone and you accepted over the phone and you got married over the phone. Draw near means to seek out. Buddy, when you've met that girl... She probably got tired of you showing up or calling on the phone. I don't know how many have relationship dating now must be crazy with this text and this stuff because you wouldn't be able to get away from them. Your phone would be blowing up all the time. You know, Back then, I remember when I was single for a while, I had a pager. And it's like, man, I'd leave and leave that thing at home. I mean, I was paid to carry it for work, but if it was on a Saturday and stuff, I mean, I'd just leave it at home. I wouldn't be bothered. But the Bible says that we're going to draw near. That means to seek out. God, don't just talk about him. Don't just read about him. Seek him out. Find him. Get close to him. Get in fellowship with his people. Get in his word. I don't mean thumb through it. I mean get into it. Desire a closer relationship. You know one of the greatest ways to draw near to God is in your prayer time, in your study time, in your time when you're down. God, reveal more of you to me today. You know what? If you ask God to show you more of Him every day, He will show more of you Him every day. You know why? Because you asked Him to. Because you desire to. Because you wanted to draw near to. You were seeking Him out. You were seeking a, a better relationship. A closer relationship. You know, God, reveal more of yourself to me. Show me more of yourself. I want to know more about you. How many times when we were dating our, our wives and all, you know, what you do today? You know, well, I got up and I took a shower and, I went, and we were like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and I ate breakfast. What'd you have? You know, we wouldn't know it all, did we? Huh? What'd you have? Yeah. Which way did you take to work? Did you take the long way? Did you take the short way? Really? How was the traffic? We just sought out every little thing about them. We want to know every part about their day. And that's what it means about drawing near to God. Seek Him out with all your heart, the Bible says. And the Bible says, what if you seek Him? Jesus said, if you seek, you'll what? You'll find Him. You want to get out of that hole? You want to get turned around? Seek out God. You can't just give a shout out to Him every time you're in a jam. He says, oh yeah, I see you down there. Dang. Looks like a pretty deep hole too. What are we going to do about that? How are we going to handle this? First thing is put the shovel down, right? You keep digging a hole. The easiest way to stop the flow is put the shovel down. Humble yourself, the Bible says. Seek out God. Resist, fight the devil, and draw near to God. Is that it? And all we got to do? I thought this would be hard, preacher. I, I, I can do all this. Yeah. Really? Let's go to the next one. Wash your hands. Well, isn't Jesus supposed to clean me? Jesus has given you the blood. He's provided the water. How many of you people go home tonight when you got home from work, you walked over the sink and you turned on the water and you called your wife and said, Honey, come wash my hands. 
Who washes your hands every day? You do. That's your personal involvement for you with God. So we are to do all these things. Put up the fight. Put on the armor. Humble ourselves and keep God number one. And then we need to start cleaning up our act a little bit. Right? Because if we draw closer to God, God reveals more about Himself. We're going to know more of God's ways. And more than likely, as it said here, we are divided between the world and God. And what we're trying to do is shrink the divide. And it takes action by us. That says, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to wash my hands of that. You ever heard that? I'll wash my hands of that. Isn't that what the Roman emperor said? Walked over with his hands in the basin. I don't want no part of that. That's on you. When the Jewish people cried out, let his blood be on our heads and our children's heads. But the emperor said, the Roman ruler said, I wash my hands of that. What's the Bible telling us? What's that look like? It's called repentance. I wash my hands of that. I'm not going to do that no more. I'm going to wash my hands of that. I'm not going to do that no more. Hard, some of the harder stuff to do now. We're getting down to that individual, nitty-gritty, do it myself every day. I'm going to wash my hands of that. Now, if we put God first, put up the good fight of resisting the devil, draw near to God, the Bible says God does what? Draws near to us. We resist the devil. What happens? We put up a good fight. The devil does what? The Bible says he'll flee. So boy, does that make it a lot easier to wash your hands. When you don't have someone poking you and prodding you and trying to get you to, oh yeah, you can do it. I know you can do it. Drive it in there. Oh man, you got stuck. <laughs> Bye. That's the world for you. Wash our hands Here's one. Purify my heart. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. That we all have sin in our heart. I can't say it any better than the way David said it in the 51st Psalm. He says, Read it first Psalm, verse 8. Give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sin. Remove the stain of my guilt. Here he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. David knew and James knew that that last one only comes when we've done all these others. There's no way to have that one without following the others. It is impossible. You have to have God number one in your life. Or your heart will never be pure. You have to resist the devil and fight every day against the temptations. You have to draw near to God. You have to seek God out and strengthen that relationship and find out more about Him and have Him reveal more to you and understand Him more. Learn more about Him. And the more you learn, the more you love. Then in you becomes this heart that desires one thing. To be right with Almighty God. That's what the Bible calls righteousness. Right with God. For preacher, we can't be perfect. I didn't see the word perfect in here one time. 
I didn't see in here that if any of these things are missed or in lacking, none of them will work. That's not what it says. See, because the Bible says that when God looks on a man, he looks at the heart. And he looks into our heart and sees in our heart and knows that God is number one. Which means if he's number one here, he'll be number one out here. But if he's not number one out here, he's not number one here. It'll show. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, your heart will be also. Show me your checkbook, I'll show you where your heart is. Every time. But when we start to do these things, and we start to fall into this pattern, and we start to seeking out God, not when we're stuck in the road, every day. When we start putting up a fight and resisting every day. When we start drawing near and humbling ourselves every day, the transformation of the heart comes, and you know what it does? It makes it pliable. You ever heard it in the Bible where it says that He is the potter and we are the clay? And He can mold us into a pure heart. And when He molds us into all the blemishes and all the faults in that heart, the Bible says, are covered by the blood of Christ. Every imperfection that we have, every shortcoming that we fall upon, God is covered and molded and stuff so that when He looks down, He sees the image of His Son. And what does He have? A pure heart. The only one that's ever walked this earth and ever truly had a pure heart. That last one comes only by the desire to fill the other ones. I don't want to. You've got to have a desire. How many of y'all agree that there's a lot of difference between a want to and a desire? You've got to have a desire. And with those things right there, you'll never be stuck in a place that God can't get you out of. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and how you teach us and you speak to us and show us how practical it is that we can use it each and every day. That it's not some big theological story. That we don't have to have some great big class. That we don't have to be in church for so many years. It's just plain and simple. That you love us and that provide ways for us to have this life and life more abundant. You just ask that we do our part. Do the things that allow you to do your things. And the more that we will follow. The more that we will do. And the more that we will seek. The, you said the closer you will get to us. And the farther the devil. What awesome promises those are. So Father, I pray that those who are believers were renewed today in following these things that James told the church do these things. For you are faithful and true to fulfill everything that's said in your word. We can count on them. So Lord, let us decide today to put you number one, to humble ourselves, to put you before us. That we put on the armor of God and we fight the good fight of our faith every day. That we seek out to draw near to you. That we wash our hands and repent of those things that we have done. And allow you to start to create in us purity of heart. Father, we just love you and we thank you and we praise you. We ask that you would watch over us, Lord. I pray for all those who may have this, this terrible virus, this, this COVID, Lord. I pray that you would protect those who don't have it, Lord. That you would guide those who are trying to come up with a, an antidote or a cure or whatever it will be. But in all the midst of all the craziness, let us never forget who we are that we're your sons and daughters and let us act accordingly. That we always bring love, grace, and mercy. That things always point to you. Father, we ask now that you watch over as we leave this place. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I've got to, you know, I, I'm going to add uh, something that I'm sure J.J. believes in from the bottom of his heart. Had he chatted with God before he tried to pull into that ATM station place, 
Um, he might have not ever got stuck there. Um, uh, so, so many times we do talk with other people instead of God first about what we're going to do. And it's so important to, uh, to check with God about what your plan is. Um, I'm just going to tell you that uh, here's our last song. I don't know if I flip this in my home. And I um, hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, thank you for being here. I am with our song. Jesus keeps me from all wrong. Bye.